and commemoration of an event that occurred 50 years ago. 50 years ago, one of our ministers was present at the March on Washington. She is not here right now. I'm talking about Reverend Barbara Prose. She was a Now, now, Barbara was very clear in letting me know. She said, I was a baby. <laughs> she, was, she was wrapped in swaddling clothes. <laughs> in her mother's arms and stood there and listened as the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom ensued. I'm glad to know that her parents had forethought. That's a good thing. Now my wife, the one they call Joy, <laughs> let me know that she attended the 20th anniversary of the March on Washington in 1983, accompanied by her father, the late Clyde Miller, and the famed theologian from Princeton, Peter Paris. So they were there, and I acknowledged that my wife was also in the midst. <clears throat> I was not there, church, but I'm here now. And I want to speak to you this morning about the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, the part that you don't hear very much about. Because this is all souls, we speak the truth in love. We seek the truth in love, and sometimes we speak it in love. Because I want you to know the rest of the story. The March on Washington has become an idyllic event, something that we recall fondly. But church in 1963, that was not the way it was. And I want to give us just a little bit of the behind the scenes of what happened on the March on Washington, and then we'll move on up to where we are now. You see, in 1941, church, in 1941, A. Philip Randolph, who organized the Union on Sleeping Car Porters, was very upset with the fact that our country still was a segregated and bigoted group of folk following white supremacy. A. Philip Randolph convened a meeting of the Unionists to speak about what must happen in 1941. And history does not say who she was, but a black woman stood up and said, we need to march on Washington. And in 1941, that idea was crystallized, and A. Philip Randolph began the process. Now, in the White House was Franklin D. Roosevelt. Franklin D. Roosevelt got wind of this march, and he said, oh, no, we can't have all y'all marching to Washington. And so he created by executive order the Fair Practices Employment Committee. That one stroke of the pen integrated factories that worked on defense contracts and unions. That one stroke of the pen in 1941 integrated defense authorized factories unions, and some federal agencies. We all know about the great migration from the South to the North that was spurred 
by the implementation of that act because black folks in the South went north, they went west, they went anywhere they could to get those factory jobs where they now could support their families. 1941. Well, fast forward on down into the 60s and still this country was reneging on the documents that authorize freedom. Now a Philip Randolph again said we must do this march. And so he got unionists. He got feminists. He got the religious community. But again, a black woman, this time in history we know her name, Anna Arnold Hedgeman, said, if we're going to do all that, we must include Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Because what he's doing down south in Birmingham, we could bring that on board. Because church, what we're talking about here is clearly defined economic justice. And so A. Philip Randolph combined his quest for economic justice with the sterling oratory presented by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And now he was set, except it was not organized. In comes Bayard Rustin, an openly gay black man who was a Quaker, who did not go for war and protested against it, who was all of those things that you say he was doing that in 1963? Oh, yes, he was. Bayard Rustin wrote a three-page organizing chart and gave it to A. Philip Randolph and said, that's how we're going to do the March on Washington. Now, church, that's the beginnings. You see, this was a radical, radical approach. There was this civil rights bill that was introduced by John Kennedy, the president at the time. It was limping alone. No one really wanted to approve this. The senators all had reason to filibuster, and it didn't look good for the Civil Rights Bill. So we had people who were very angry, but nothing was going to get done. What A. Philip Randolph and others, Bayard Rustin, wanted to touch, they wanted to touch people's moral core. They wanted to ask the moral question, is the United States of America going to continue its practices on those citizens of color, the practices that are, that are inequitable, the practices that are unfair, the practices that discriminate, the legacy of white supremacy. Are you, America, going to continue this? And so they took a radical approach. And please understand, church, 1963, it was radical to say that we're going to have all of these African Americans and liberals and progressives around the country gather together in Washington to protest in civil disobedience. But what A. Philip Randolph and others, Bayard Rustin, understood was that moral question that they posed was going to be answered. They understood that most folks in America had a feeling deep down inside that resonated with those who were oppressed. It was a divine discomfort, a divine discomfort because they understood that God is good and this is not. Discrimination and, and the legacy of supremacy was not based upon fairness. So they understood that people deep down had this divine discontent. Now church, there were some folks who interpreted divine discontent to be something else. Imagine 100,000 black folks gathered together, hide the women and children. 
Lawrence Spivak. Remember Lawrence Spivak on Meet the Press? For many, many years, he was the host. He had Dr. Keene and Roy Wilkins on. And he posed the question. He said, do you realize that most Americans are fully, unalterably afraid of 100,000 Negroes gathering in Washington, D.C. There's going to be an incident, or dare we say, a riot. He, he said that to King and Wilkins because he knew that's what most folks were thinking. And so they prepared. Oh, yes, they did. Now, you know I'm a baseball fan. Baseball is played regardless, but not on August the 28th, 1963 in Washington, D.C. The Washington Senators canceled their game with the Minnesota Twins. All the bars and liquor stores closed down. The stores that had valuable jewelry closed up. Do you hear me, church? They understood that the Negroes are coming. <laughs> and so they took precautions. On the military front, we had National Guardsmen, Army. We had 15,000 Airborne, 182nd Airborne standing by. 15,000. Fort Meade had 4,000 soldiers ready to go across the Potomac. Everybody was there, ready. President Kennedy was extended an invitation to attend, and he said, uh, no. <laughs> and the word is spoken that he sat and listened by the loudspeaker to the speakers. And it is said, of course, you know, revisionist history. But it is said that Kennedy, after hearing the speeches, said, I should have gone. But church, he didn't. And many people took the position that said, no, I'm telling you this history. Because church, I want you to understand we always want to make things palatable and comfortable. But church, sometimes it's all right to be raw. It's all right to come from your heart. It's all right to speak truth to power. You may be halting in your approach, but it comes out. You realize that there is this divine discontent. So you're not by yourself. And so you got to take a stand sometimes, church, and not just sugarcoat everything. One of the things I remember my father would always say to me, Jerry, don't go for the okie doke. Now, in his parlance, okie doke meant a pat on the head, it's going to be okay, go away. The okie doke was all around, just be quiet. Accept what I'm saying, even though it's far fetched, accept what I'm saying and do it. But he, as my father said, don't go for the okie doke. And the okie doke is what we have been fed with the March on Washington. The March on Washington was a radical, radical, on the edge movement. And if you listen to the speakers, if you read the speeches, how many times will you hear the word revolution? Folks knew that they were there and they were breaking the law. They did it anyway. The March on Washington has been uh, and, 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 and aseptatized. What's that word? Sanitized. sanitized. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> it's been sanitized. The March on Washington has been sanitized. And so we say, oh yeah, that's when Dr. King gave the I Have a Dream speech. <laughs> it wasn't just like that, church. Let's, let me tell you something. The reason why folks didn't get crazy like people expected them to is that they were educated. They were organized. Bayer Rustin had done his job. People were organized. They were ready to roll. They knew what to do. Dr. King had said a long, long time ago, look here, we can't have power without love, and you can't have love without power. He said power without love is reckless and abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. 
He said, you got to have the two together, power and love. You're not going to have them separately. So we're not going to destroy anything, but we're going to demonstrate civilly why it is important that we have what we need to have. So here we go. The March on Washington had several speakers. The leaders of the big six, John Lewis, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, James Foreman with Congress of Racial Equality, A. Philip Randolph with the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Then you had Roy Wilkins with the NAACP. You had Dr. King with the SCLC. You had Whitney Young with the National Urban League. That's the only Unitarian that I could tell who was there. <laughs> Please let it be known, people don't, don't remember that, but Whitney Young was a Unitarian Universalist in 1963 when he spoke as, as chairman of the National Urban League. We had these famed speakers, but we also had Walter Ruther, who was leader and founder of uh, UAW, United Auto Workers. And you had religious people from Jewish and the National Council of Churches, they were there and they spoke. All of those speakers, all of those speakers spoke on economic justice. They were very clear, it's about poor people not getting economic justice, not getting a decent wage to live. Church don't go for the okie doke. The speakers were lined up to give hard bullet points that had to do with a better place, freedom, implementing freedom. And then Dr. King came on last. He was the last speaker because they wanted Dr. King to give the uplift. They wanted Dr. King to give something to get people uh, momentum. Now here's the rest of the story on that. Dr. King had prepared his speech and you remember he talks about insufficient funds, talks about that that bounce check, right? That was his prepared text dealing with economy. He was focusing on economic justice. And Mahalia Jackson was about 20 feet away from Dr. King. Dr. King had earlier given a speech in Detroit, their march, and he had spoken about the dream. Mahalia Jackson had earlier sung, and Dr. King was going along with his his uh, point on insufficient funds and moving that. And Mahalia, 20 feet away, said, tell them about the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. She said it twice. And Dr. King, they said, took his prepared text. He shifted it to the left and he leaned. Now it is said that a minister was standing behind him and turned to another minister and said, these people don't know it yet, but they about to go to church. <laughs> and that's when Dr. King shifted into, I have a dream. He shifted into that and he focused on the fact of what was going down in the South. Civil rights. To be seen as a human being. It doesn't do very much if you don't have a job. But first of all, please understand to be seen as a human being. You remember in Memphis, the protesters that, who were garbage men, I heard recycled technicians. <laughs> and they had called Dr. King before Dr. King was assassinated. They had called him to Memphis. And you saw them walking in their, in their march and they had a sign that said, I am a man. That's the bottom line here. That's what Dr. King was reaching back and talking about being somebody. And you know, that speech is what people remember about the march. But right after Dr. King spoke, right after Dr. King spoke, Bayard Rustin, was introduced by A. Philip Randolph, and he told 
A. Philip Randolph told the people, Bayard Rustin will read our list of demands. This is why we are here. After the demands are read, we will retire and go to the White House and present these demands to President Kennedy. This is why we are here. I want you, all souls, to hear by your Rustin reading the list of demands. Here we go. And the other the eight feet of gold, they are carrying with them the demands which you have given your approval to. The first demand is that we have effective civil rights legislation, no compromise, no filibuster, and that it includes public accommodation, decent housing, integrated education, LGBT, and the right to vote. What do you say? <laughs> number two, number two, they want that we demand the withholding of federal funds from all programs in which discrimination exists. What do you say? That was Bayard Rustin reading the list of demands that you never hear. You never hear about those demands, but as soon as the people said, we so demand, that was the point of the March on Washington. But church, there's another part that people have said over and over again, well, what about those demands? Were they ever implemented? Some were, some were not. But what does that mean? What does that mean for someone who has divine discontent, who is maladjusted to a system that discriminates? What does that mean? But if not, you see church, when you make a decision, you're not thinking about, oh, I'm going to get it. Everything that I wanted is going to come to me. But the decision to stand up in the face of injustice, that's a decision that is made not looking toward the reward, but a decision that is made with, this is what I've been given to do. This is my task, church. That you are called to be a witness. 
You are not called to sit and buy and be comfortable, but you are called to challenge and make this place a better place. But if not, yes, if the things are not the way you wanted to do, what does that mean? It only means that I'm not doing it for that. I'm standing up anyway. I'm going to be a bright light. I'm not going to have myself under a bushel basket. I'm going to let people know that God is good, and that means that I'm going to make it my business to do good. It's important, church, that we who have the divine discontent understand that we're not doing this to get our picture in the paper, to get recorded, to be quoted. We're doing it because God wants us to do it. We are part of something larger than ourselves. Church, at the end of this march on Washington, A. Philip Randolph walked up and he read a pledge. And that pledge had to do with going back into your homes and dealing with neighbors and friends and telling them about the process that needs to be done and pledging to march, pledging to write letters, pledging to, to work through the justice system, pledging to do whatever is necessary in order to make peace a reality. And the last line, church, the last line of this pledge, A. Philip Randolph read, he said, I pledge my heart and my mind and my body unequivocally without any personal regard to personal sacrifice, to achieve social peace through social justice. Church, I do pledge.